this uh, first lecture is an introduction to uh, cloud computing and, and virtual machines. It was interesting uh, to hear everybody's background because um, in a way it's not quite, we, we weren't quite, this is the first time we're giving this workshop and we weren't quite sure what kind of students we were going to get. So it's very interesting that we have uh, a lot of uh, sort of very sort of computationally aware biologist uh, is, is sort of how I would describe the, the, the whole group uh, as a whole. And uh, it's very it's, it's very interesting and I think you, you will uh, get a lot of this class. A disclaimer up front is that I may mention a number of companies and, and whatnot. I have no association with um, any of these companies. I did realize though as I was thinking back about this slide at some of my slides, I do mention the collaboratory, and this is something we'll be talking about throughout. And Anne's already talked about it, and many of the speakers today are going to today and tomorrow are going to talk about it. I actually am a PI on the collaboratory, so I did financially get grant money from the collaboratory, but not to me, just to to the group. So that's my email address, my Twitter handle, and this is the CW Big Data sixteen is the, the hashtag I invented for this workshop. As Anne mentioned, this is part of the bioinformatics.ca workshop, and this is a website, of course, you all know from having registered and, and founded to, to get this course. Our flagship workshop, I would say, is the cancer genomics workshop. So that's the, uh, the one workshop some of you have taken, which is uh, it's our longest day. It's a five-day workshop, not the longest, but it's a long uh, five-day workshop where we cover many of the things that are dear and close to the OICR. And um, so bioinformatics.ca is a pan-Canadian bioinformatics sort of portal, but it is hosted here at the OICR. So the workshops that we're planning in uh, 2017, this is pending uh, uh, approval by the, um, the committee that oversees a bioinformatics workshop, which is meeting next week, uh, will be basically the same as what we gave this year plus uh, probably uh, one, a new workshop that's in uh, development at uh, so the sort of late November, early mid November, I'd say you'll probably go can go to bioinformatics.ca and see the offering for all the workshops. And so, if there are workshops you haven't taken that you might be interested in, or you'd like to tell your friends about other workshops, uh, please feel free to do so. For the workshops uh, that have been given already, you can have a sort of a sneak peek of how what was given and so by looking at last year's course material so we have on the portal right now we have the 2015 uh, material so the 2016 is not there yet but on the github which is also open it does have all the workshops and all the material that have been given so far including the lab exercises and so forth so you can have a good look at those workshops and see if that's a workshop that you might be interested in and uh, and then you know, of course, the course info email address, the website, and there's a an, uh, mailing list that you can subscribe to that announces all their upcoming workshops and, and, and things like that. So that's a, a thing that you're encouraged to do. So just for one second, I'm going to sort of stand on my soapbox just to advocate for, promote, um, support, and so forth. Uh, all the open movement. So uh, the open source, obviously, many of the software packages that we're going to be talking about are open source uh, packages. Open access is with respect to all the publications. So many of the publications we cite and we uh, use in our teaching are, are openly available to the community. Open data, obviously, with respect to uh, sharing of data and making that available and making science reproducible. With the caveats that we're going to talk about at, uh, Mark and myself and talk a bit about with respect to human data and then the challenges uh, that that presents with respect to sharing and so forth. And open courseware, which is like the CBW, uh, is uh, sharing all the, the course material and making it available for others to teach. So it's, and we're part of, uh, Bioinformatics.ca is part of uh, Goblet, which is a global alliance of, of training, teaching uh, in bioinformatics, that's that where we sort of share with the world basically and, and with the, on their portal all the material that we have and, and best practices for teaching and so forth. So we're very much involved in sort of this uh, open movement. So I'm going to start uh, this in Washington 
And I was at the NCBI for five years from uh, 93 to 98, so a long time ago. And during uh, this, um, at the NCBI, I was in charge of GenBank. So it's a DNA sequence database that uh, is, um, has been growing over time uh, since it was uh, first started in the late 80s. And so these are the, the five years I was at NCBI. And so it was a very sort of active period. Uh, we kept, we had, we were sort of always behind the eight ball, sort of dealing with the inundation of data and so forth. And we even sort of started panicking. After I left, I remember still getting emails from people who said, oh my God, you know, we're never gonna make it, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's overwhelming. And then a few years later, I was invited to NIH to uh, um, chair a session on the 25th anniversary of GenBank. And uh, this was the, sort of the growth curve of the 25th anniversary of GenBank, and that was my period. <laughs> and so, you had a little white sliver there at the bottom. And so, of course, uh, sort of the, the, what we refer to as big data is always changing, and we thought we were dealing with big data in the, in the 90s, and we thought we were dealing with big data in the 2000s, and of course, now it's even uh, worse. And so, some of the uh, learning objectives for this module are going to be to understand the scope of, of big data and, and human genome and dealing with uh, th those challenges. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the cloud and um, the concerns we, we have about using it and, and uh, the, uh, what we can how we can work in the cloud and how we can work with virtual machines and so forth. And so my lecture is sort of going to use a lot of terminology that's going to be used by all the other faculty throughout the workshop. And it's going to be really important. It's sort of basic concepts, but if you don't get it, it's, it's definitely time to, to ask questions and we'll have lots of time. So like I mentioned, so big data is a relative term. So the first picture is a five meg uh, hard drive uh, being forklifted into a plane. Uh, and, and, and next to the bottom picture is a five terabyte, which is um, uh, a million times more data or a million times more storage into a device uh, for a fraction of the space. And so it's, uh, and of course, so we're talking terabytes, we're talking petabytes, and soon we'll be talking exabytes and so forth. So it's really, it's useful to understand um, uh, this, these terminology and, and the order of magnitude they represent. So this is a um, figure. Let me try to look at it. So we're at 2016 here now. So we're at the end of the graph. And so the red line, the top line, is the uh, the doubling time with the current projection. The yellow line is the uh, um, what Illumina is estimates, and Illumina being a sequencing uh, company. And so they're they're even more conservative than than what uh, the, what we've been doing so far, and I think that's probably their projection of sequences generated on their machines. And so, <laughs> and so there, there there's just a fraction of the total. And uh, in Moore's law, which is the sort of the the, the law, the physical law of, of how fast processors uh, have their doubling speed as the processors uh, is is below that. So we're actually surpassing. Data is surpassing the, the, the capacity to process this data. So that same article in, uh, in PLUS had a, um, an interesting table about so comparing genomics to, fit to physics with respect to the accumulation of data and, and the bandwidth that they have to deal with. And so, um, uh, so we're now in the, the Zeta space uh, and the um, So it's, it's starting, so I've copied in my little uh, cheat sheet here from Wikipedia to uh, help you with uh, uh, Zeta, Exa, and so forth. And so uh, PETA is 1,000 terabytes. So we're, terabytes, you sort of, everybody familiar with terabyte space order of magnitude, right? So if you get a storage hard disk, you can get a terabyte on your desktop pretty easily. Petabyte, you start needing sort of a data center, and so it's a thousand terabytes, and so XL will be a thousand petabytes, and Zeta is a um, 
million uh, petabytes. And so, um, so now it's estimated that there's going to be enough to see, generate one zettabase per year. So a zettabase is a sextillion, right? So that's 10 to the 21 versus, so it's a million times um, a petabyte. So per year across the planet. And of course, the challenge becomes now to moving these files around and, and making them available for people. And so this is where cloud computing, of course, comes in, where you don't move these files around. You leave the data where it is. Then you yourself, you move. And so you move the software, which is obviously a lot smaller files. And that's the whole rationale behind what we're going to be doing in this workshop. So what's driving this data growth? Of course, it's the technology. So on the left is a, the, the Broad, uh, or sorry, the Whitehead is now the Broad in Boston. And for the 2001 paper, which is the first, uh, the first genomes, human genome was sequenced, it took about 10 years to do one genome. And it took about, there's about 50 plus sequencers in this lab. And there was uh, probably another few hundred in other labs across the world. And all of those together, but they all do, it was all so-called uh, capillary or, or non-next-gen uh, type sequencing technology. So it was, it was done with the old technology. So the equivalent of this you know, 50 plus sequencing capillaries is now basically about one Illumina machine today. And some of these labs today have 100 Illumina machines. And so you can imagine how much uh, they can generate. And so that explains sort of the previous, some of the previous graphs I showed you. Uh, Illumina also has uh, what they call the HiSeq X sequencing system, which is basically 10 sequencers, 10 Illumina-like sequencers. And you have to buy them all 10 together, um, except there's, um, they, they weren't, sell well, they, were, they sold a few, but the, uh, Canada got an award for one of these and they split it across three cities. And so Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver each got uh, part of the 10. So they, they have, uh, uh, a f they split, they can split them. They ship the parts to different places. Uh, the, uh, but these are only used for, although I think that's changing now, but they were only used initially for whole human genome sequencing. I think now they allow other mammals. They, of course, the machine doesn't know if it's a mammal or, or a human or a chimpanzee or a mouse, but uh, I think they from their pipelines and so forth. But that said, so you can you can on one of these systems you can sequence eighteen thousand whole genomes per year, which is a lot of genomes for any given center. But that means it would still take you eighteen hundred years to sequence everybody in Canada, so it's still quite a bit. But if uh, later on, we'll be talking about the Peacock project where we're doing an analysis of 2,500 genomes, whole genomes, and that would have taken 1.5 months to sequence all of those with uh, one uh, X10. And so there's obviously, and some people have multiple X10s, and, and some um, are, you know, and they're growing. So, and they, of course, you can distribute and so forth. So, um, with, soft, with uh, cloud computing, there's basically a new software paradigm. There's a paradigm shift that's happening in that it's not, you don't sort of get data, download it, and compute on it, read the file, and spit out and write the, the output. But the paradigm shift is in that now the data is not moving because it's so big. So you move, you move your software to where the data is, and um, there's also Hasn't, there's some algorithms are, are, are working this way now is basically they're working on a data stream and so it's not it's a data coming out of the machine it gets processed while it's still in RAM and without having to write it and then you you write the output to, to, to disk and so that you don't have to there's no read file initial first step you just sort of uh, read the stream uh, from the stream and so it's a whole different way of doing things. It's, and it's not all software. There's still lots of software that reads files and, and writes files and so forth. But there's definitely the, the shift it was starting to be talked about uh, a few years ago at the AGBT, the, which is the Advanced um, AGBT, Advanced Genomics. 
What does AGBT stand for? Uh, Advance in Genome Biology and Technology. Yeah. So it's basically the trade show for Illumina and all the sequencing machines uh, and all the vendors that do are in that space. And so it's it's a it's a very interesting uh, meeting to go to to find out what the latest stuff is. So uh, a few years ago, uh, Lincoln Stein, who's our our director here of informatics and biocomputing, um, wrote a paper about a case for to convince people that they needed to move to the cloud. And so it's sort of a paper that would not be written today because it's sort of obvious today. But at the time, it was less obvious. And it was definitely a sort of an interesting um, uh, challenge. But he, in this paper, he did sort of bring up some other challenges that we haven't sort of quite figured out yet. And so I'm going to just print all the, the, the lines here. And so the first one was the, uh, the cost of storage, so, uh, which is doubling about every 14 months. Uh, so the doubling, i.e. you can store more, uh, or the price is reducing, uh, you can store more megabase per dollar uh, over time. Before next-gen sequencing, had a doubling time of about 19 months, and then after next-gen sequencing was introduced in about 2002, 2003, uh, sequencing uh, had a doubling time of every four months. And so what happens now is that the cost of storing a nucleotide is going to become more expensive than the cost of sequencing a nucleotide. So it's a... Uh, so. With the X10 and, and the 10X, I'm sure, actually both of those uh, sort of long read technologies, um, there is the $1,000, the so-called $1,000 genome is, is here, it's 1,200, or it could, be a few, it could be a couple of thousand depending on how it's done, but it's sort of the, that's that order of magnitude. The first genome I mentioned, the 2001 human genome, that single genome, which took 10 years to do, cost about a billion dollars, and so now, we're about thousand dollars, and so it's a uh, it's quite a it's quite a reduction in price, of course. But now the what's happening is that with the cost of sequencing outpacing the cost of the the cost of storing, it's becoming cheaper to resequence a genome than to store it, if you think about it, which doesn't make sense because uh, and it's actually not practical at all. So what happens is that although the storing of the DNA sequence might be uh, expensive and sequencing it might be less expensive, doing the, if you factor in the analysis that you needed to figure out what that, that nucleotide is, that adds quite a bit of price to it. And also there are some samples, especially what we deal with here in cancer, that are actually, you, you don't have the ability to Resequence them all the time because you have limited amounts of DNA, so that's an that's an issue. And the biggest issue is actually bandwidth. Bandwidth at the sequencing level is we don't have bandwidth to sequence everything all the time, and so we do need to store bytes and not uh, minus eighty DNA to be able to resequence it. Although that's probably the most compact form of sequencing DNA of storing DNAs in, in the freezer at minus eighty. Um, but so those are things that uh, definitely are, uh, are to be considered. So, so we have lots of data. We basically, in many places, we have inadequate sort of IT infrastructure in most labs. Some labs are, are more in doubt than others. But if you go across the world and across all the biologists and what they have access to, there's quite a bit of, of, of places that don't have quite exactly what's needed. And uh, we could write more grants, or we could get more hardware, or we could definitely look to the sky. And it, definitely a number of companies have done this. So a lot of sequencing companies, Illumina and, and others, have do that. So you can send them your DNA, they'll sequence it, they'll put it, ship the hard drives to Amazon, and then, or get the data to Amazon one way or another, and, and then you can do the analysis on Amazon in the cloud. The uh, shipping part, I remember speaking to bioinformatics people at Amazon, and they said, "Oh yeah, we're really good at shipping stuff." And so, <laughs> really, so shipping hard drives is not a problem for them, and uh, they do it all the time. And so, um, so you can ship your hard drive to Amazon. That's the fastest 
bandwidth, of course, you can get uh, data on, uh, onto the cloud. That said, uploading data to Amazon is free, so it's if you have the time, then you can do it, you can do it that way as well. And of course, a number of companies already use Amazon. So we talked about Lumina, Nanopore, which is another sequencing technology, uh, Dropbox, Twitter, Netflix, and so forth. All use uh, Amazon and are all sort of using the, the sort of the elastic cloud availabilities and so forth that, that are possible there. And so. And, and so that's, that's happening now. Likewise, there's a large number of, of companies that have data centers all over the world that are uh, humongous. I think I spotted a typo here. The, I think the uh, Apple data center in uh, Ireland is more than 1.9 million, 1.8 million. It's probably 1.9 billion. <laughs> and, but the other ones are all in billions, so I think that one's wrong. But so, of course, Apple, Microsoft, uh, a number of companies have large data centers, cloud infrastructures that they make available. So, of, of course, we call them clouds, but they, they're actually physically somewhere on the planet, uh, on, the fl on the ground, not in the air. <laughs> and, uh, but they are available from mostly from everywhere on the, on, on the planet. So, Amazon, which um, are Amazon Web Services, which in part was developed to deal with their shipping and handling of, of, of business that they had to do. And then they realized that they built all this infrastructure and then they had some extra sort of uh, bandwidth available. And they said, oh, maybe we can sell this service to people. And it turned out to, to be one of the first and one of the bigger sort of service providers. And, um, and they've developed a method by which basically they encase, encase large data center units uh, that they build, and then they want to add one of these things which would have, you know, maybe 100 racks with all this hardware storage and, and CPU on it, and they just back, you know, get a truck, bring it in, and hook it up to the data center. And so they have data centers which are larger than multiple football fields of, of, of these containers, that each of which can just hook up to each other and, and make um, the, the resources available. Um, one of the sort of concepts that I think I first heard from Amazon, although I'm not sure if they were the first, I'm assuming they were one of the early ones, is this concept of elastic uh, computing, which is basically the ability to use the amount as much as you need and stretch and stretch and stretch and to get more if you need it. And then if you don't need as much, then you sort of let the rubber band sort of come back together and use smaller amounts or just you know turn it off altogether. So it's the ability to come in and use the amount of compute and infrastructure you need to do the job you need to do and then sort of close it up afterwards. And so that from a user's point of view, it can be a lot more convenient and cheaper than maintaining your own data center year round, which is going to have more or less usage um, uh, throughout the year. That said, for example, OICR has a pretty, we have actually three data centers, three rooms, separate machine rooms with, with computes, and we use Amazon as well. And we use other external, uh, Christina will talk about it more uh, tomorrow. We, we've used infrastructure like all over the world. So there is always a place like OICR, which has 150 plus or 130 plus uh, bioinformatics people will use all the compute infrastructure we have here, and then it will need more than that at different times, then it will go out and use for different projects and go out and, and use that uh, externally. The same way the Cancer Genome Collaboratory is an example of a cloud infrastructure that's uh, academic in nature, but that uh, we're going to uh, run as a uh, sort of cost recovery sort of method to actually, so we'll have data, we'll have cancer genomic data on it, or we have cancer genomic data on it, and then, but we'll charge people eventually, we haven't started doing that yet, but the, the plan is to charge people to use cycles on, on the collaboratory. So we'll have all the permissions you need to access human genome data, and the cancer human gen genome data in our case, and, uh, and then the compute cycles. So why would somebody use that instead of using Amazon? 
Well, because we have the data here already. There, some of it is on Amazon, but we have actually a bigger data set here available. So if you want to compute on this data set, then it makes sense to go where the data is. And so um, likewise, um, Amazon might be better if you want to do bigger jobs than the number of CPU they have, because they're much bigger institution or organization, they have the, their elastic band can stretch a lot bigger than ours. And so they will be able to do much larger jobs compared to what we have. But what we'll have available is going to be, is going to satisfy what we think uh, most people that want to do sort of cancer research. So, I, so Amazon is, 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 is not cheap. And so there you can go look at the pricing and uh, um, there. To move files to Amazon, as I mentioned, is free. But to download them is not free. So you can generate lots of data. So you can move your, your BAM files, for example. Do your computes. So you get charged for the computes. Then you want to download the VCF files, which are much smaller files then you will have to pay for that, that, that bandwidth of, of the downloading the files. So downloading the files is going to, always going to cost you at a place like Amazon. Uh, and it may not be uh, the best place uh, for, for everybody. So, so Amazon, so collaboratory may be better for you or some other academic cloud or if you have collaborators in Europe, there might be some clouds there that are more are easier and so forth. Um, there, we'll talk about standardization. There's lots of, of things that, from a one of the reasons why we've been so things have worked out so well for us using Amazon is it's pretty standard hardware and software is involved there, and, and it's very there are no surprises. If you go to an academic cloud, you might get surprises, uh, and uh, not all clouds when we uh, I'm not sure if Christina is going to talk about that, but when we started, we were doing the, the Peacock project, we invited all the people, part of the project from all over the world, to contribute cycles. And they all said, if you have cloud infrastructure available to you, please let us know. And turns out that not everybody has the same definition for a cloud infrastructure. And so uh, some places, they'll ask you to tell them which command you want to run and they'll run it for you. Uh, what do you want me to type? And they'll type it for you. <laughs> and they don't actually let you log into their system and, and do, the, do it yourself. So, so that's a, sort of a differences. But with Amazon, of course, you could, you, there's, that's a lot more clear and, and standardized. PHI, uh, Mark's going to talk a lot about that and, and sort of dealing with this, uh, the security uh, concerns and personal health information. The challenge there is the variation of those laws across the world. And for the ICGC with the International Cancer Genome Consortium and dealing with the cancer data from many countries, they each have their own rules and, 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 and reality that we have to check in. And Amazon being a US-based company, although it's a multinational, but it's still US-based, it's still um, deals, be, it's part of the, it's, Basically, the Patriot Act, which allows um, uh, the law enforcement to go and reach through servers and data without, you know, with minimal sort of uh, uh, any suspicion of terrorist activity and so forth, uh, would reach through uh, even an Amazon server based in Ireland, for example. So, because Amazon is is a uh, as a U.S. company, then if you have German data on Amazon in Europe, the, 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 the Patriot Act would allow people, if the Americans suspected the Germans to be involved in some activity, they would go in there. And so the Germans don't like that, and so they actually don't put their data on Amazon. And so it's a sort of a, it's part of the deals and, and, and realities of, of doing uh, uh, that kind of data. So. Compute Canada was part and responsible was overseeing all large compute infrastructures across Canada. And, and basically their aim and vision and so forth is to make the best resources available to Canadians. So uh, a challenge for us to use a Compute Canada infrastructure in this workshop, but not in this class, I don't think, is that everybody's based in Canada. So that's 
that's okay, it's good. <laughs> uh, if you use, so we actually, the collaboratory is, a, is part of the Compute Canada, but it's actually going to be working differently because we have this different uh, sort of business model that we've uh, presented to them and they accept it to us to, to do. But other Compute Canada resources which have been used in other workshops like the um, metabolomics, I think it was, and is it metab no, the, the micro uh, microbiome workshop, right? Or no? Non Amazon. They use a Compute Canada. It was the Quebec City. It was a, it was a um, epigenomics one. Yes, that's right. It was Guillaume in Quebec, in Montreal. And so in Montreal, they, they use a Compute Canada infrastructure. And there they had American students that could use the infrastructure during the workshop but couldn't use it after they, they went home. So that's a bit of a problem for the international nature of our student population. We have, so we've taught in CBW over the last uh, 17 years, we've taught about 2,200 people, so maybe 2,200, 2,300, and maybe three or 400 of those are international. And so we've had a number of international students, so we're very much sort of aware. That said, the collaboratory will not have that issue. So what we're going to be looking at uh, in the next couple of days is going to be uh, Compute Canada infrastructure, which is uh, funded by Canadian dollars, but which will not have uh, this, uh, this issue. So that's going to be um, very useful. And so, as I mentioned, uh, availability usable in a workshop, and the collaboratory is, it will pay for cycles later on. So how to interact with the cloud? So, so one way of thinking about the cloud is a sort of a uh, high performance or HPC system that uh, somebody else is taking care of. So it's not local. It's a bit awkward to say that here at OICR because we're taking care of our own cloud here. And so it doesn't apply to us here. But in general, when you're going to be using a cloud infrastructure, you actually don't need to know where it's physically located. It's somewhere on, in the internet. So you have an IP address, you have a domain name, you, can, you know how to reach it. And, um, but it's as if it was you're buying or leasing or borrowing a slice of the infrastructure for yourself and calling it your own. So you basically, it's as if you had sort of root access to your own system that you're, which is protected from everybody else's activities in a computer infrastructure. And, um, and so this concept of elasticity I, I mentioned earlier is, um, is really a useful way of thinking about you take up as much as you need and when you don't use it, you let it go basically. And so that it's really important from a, if you consider small clouds and large clouds, so if you think of Amazon as a very, very big cloud and the collaboratory as a small cloud, uh, it will be very important to let go of the rubber band of the elastic once you finish using it so that you'll be able to, you'll make the resources available. It's not, none of these, even Amazon is not infinite, but Amazon has so much that it's hard to see how and they want you to spend, so they'll make it <laughs> very much available. So another way of thinking about it is that a traditional computer, and that could be your laptop or it could be a high-performance computer, will have a um, sort of hardware layer, will have an operating system layer, and then you'll have your software. And so you can think if you put all of that in a bag, you have to have security to get into that bag. So you'll have security to get into the machine room, basically, or you'll have security to get to log into your desktop computer. And so you have to know the password to get onto the computer to be able to do things. The uh, virtual machine concept is that instead of the operating system layer is more a, a layer that's allowing multiple little machines, if you want to think of it that way, to spin off and, and be themselves enclosed into uh, um, a, as if it was a, 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 your own laptop or as if it was a thousand laptops that you had access to that you could launch jobs on and, and so forth. So the skill 
and challenge and learn and using these kind of hardware is one where's the front door so how do i get into the system and how do i manage 10 copies of a, of a, of a pipeline versus 100 versus 1000 and some systems allow you to do that and some don't and, and learning the differences of the various systems is 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 really uh, important another additional sort of container thing that we're going to talk about in the next two days is Docker. And Docker is, uh, I'll go over so basically Docker is a container that works within a VM basically. So it's like in, in this Docker container you have all the, the, the nuts and bolts you need to run a pipeline, to run one tool. Let's say it's the simplest way of thinking about it it's just it does one tool, but of course you can run multiple tools in, in, in chain, but or you can run Docker's in chain as well. But the simplest way to thinking about it is that it's a container that has all the libraries, all the the software, all the the things you need to to put together to run a, 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 an application. And so, in that, it's. Um, it's also referred to as being very lightweight in the sense that it's, it's not a very big file. And then you can store that file when you're not using it. And then you can share that file with other people so that people can reproduce and run the same application you just ran and with the same libraries and the same software and the same code and so forth and have it so that it's totally reproducible. So the big concept behind all of this is that it's to enable science to be reproducible, to make uh, things uh, easy to share, to make things open, to make things... Uh, so the whole Docker project is an open source uh, project. The, um, the virtual machine space is actually very much... There's lots of open source projects, but there's lots of commercial projects in that space. VMware is the first one that comes to mind as a commercial project. And so VMware... Well, is, is a tool to generate VMs, virtual machines, that allows you to, to, to run multiple. So for example, you can run a Linux uh, environment with Linux tools on your Mac or your PC, because you've got a VMware layer that allows you to abstract the operating system and then run that separately. And so Docker is a way of, uh, of uh, putting things together in a way that makes it easier to for you to uh, to share, store, and 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 reproduce uh, other things. And so we'll talk about ways of distributing Docker and ways of sharing Docker uh, uh, containers. And and um, we'll have you'll have lots of uh, practice with those uh, later on. <coughs> So the other sort of flip side of the workshop here is that we're dealing with human data. And so there's a lot of uh, caveats that come and, and restrictions and, and things that you have to worry about with respect to human data. And so um, so this personal health information, which is obviously clinical information, which is, 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 is important and uh, and should be considered, and many people consider as private information. And genome sequences is the ultimate sort of genome personal health information in the sense that it's totally identifiable to you, and it's very, uh, it, it has a great prognostic uh, capacity in the sense that you can get a lot of information about the person by looking at their genome. And so how come we have so many genomes available to us to do research? Well, the, uh, Mark will talk about that later, but there's a lot has to do with the, the, our society basically is entrusted scientists to do good things with this information. And so it allows us to do, uh, to make discoveries about cures for cancer and, and, and many other genetic diseases and so forth. And so that whole concept about uh, the, the balance and the responsibility of scientists to use this information in an appropriate way and to not try to re-identify people and, and to not, and, and all many things that Mark's going to talk about, 
is really critical in our use of human genome data. I um, explored with uh, uh, Bartlett Knoppers, who was actually a PI on, on the collaboratory grant, which is also a bioethicist, about the possibility of us doing, of getting sort of for this class, getting uh, DACO access or controlled access to, to data. And it was entertained for a few minutes and then <laughs> discarded <laughs> as a, not a, a feasible uh, idea. Although it's been done in other courses with other data sets. But um, that said, it's a, uh, it's a very uh, serious and a very important thing that people need to consider very carefully when they do require access to this kind of data and do get it and what they ha what that means from uh, from the patient's point of view that have made this data available to them and what it means from a society a research community point of view as well so it's a, it's a really yes do you think that one point of our mankind history will be able to share all personal information all genome information so that's a very interesting question so that are we going to be able to share everything with or everywhere um, Maybe you better wait for <laughs> Mark to ask that question. I think, so, so the, for example, right now we share what we look like, right? I mean, that's sort of public domain, what we look like. And uh, so there's, you know, I don't know how many billions of people on the planet now, but we can all look at every face, basically, and, and so forth. There's some laws that sort of prevent not publishing the face. You don't have permission to take pictures and publish them, but I think... We could have security by obscurity in the sense that if there were six billion genomes available right now, if we had every genome available, uh, that would be a very interesting uh, uh, possibility. Yeah. All personal information. And all the, the clinical information that goes with it. Yeah. Which will be, I mean, that's the ultimate data set, right? I mean, it's the, so we'll be able to, to deconvolute environment and, and genomic and, and, uh, and and phenotype outcome. So, uh, I, in our lifetime, I'm not sure, but maybe in the next 50 years, I'm, I'm older than you, so you'll still be alive in 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we can uh, revisit that later, I think, uh, yeah. So, um, so in this workshop, you're gonna learn about the ethics and the rules uh, allowing you to use human data. You're going to learn about VMs and Docker and uh, collaboratory and PCOG. So PCOG is a uh, pan-cancer analysis of whole genome. So it's a project where we've made extensive use of Docker and, and uh, cloud computing uh, across the world. And, uh, and so and Christina is going to talk about that. And that's it for me. Any questions? I'm a bit early, I think. Yeah. So, I can, yes, Anne. Yes.
and, and there's a lot, uh, there was a lot of concerns at the beginning with, with uh, cloud computing about security. And actually, places like Amazon, and I'm, I'm assuming repository too, because it's, it's a new, it's a new infrastructure, are a lot more secure than a lot of laptops and than a lot of other computing infrastructure, or a lot of academic cloud. And so Amazon is actually probably more secure than most computer systems you've ever come across. And they have double encryption, they have the encryption between the transfers, encryption once you're on the system, you need a five key, you need uh, uh, two-factor authentication to get on and so forth. So there's all sorts of layers of security that are available on Amazon that are not available in many academic clouds or many academic HPC get a window, you type in your password, and you're in. And so, um, and hopefully, you know, sysadmin, sysadmin, login <laughs> password, <laughs> it doesn't work <laughs> for that one. And so, but that said, you know, I mean, YCR, for example, actually, the system group here prides itself and actually has a very secure system. And they actually, they don't have two-factor authentication, but they have, uh, you know, they do a pretty rigorous uh, password check and and they, they they monitor a lot to make sure there's no sort of illegal activity. We get poked at by the, the rest of the world extensively, and they see the poking, but they they also see that nobody's getting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Can you pull the slides up again? Yeah. 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 Can you put several boxes together to make a pipeline? For example, something runs fast in Mac, and uh, then another program runs fast in Linux. Uh, so, so the Docker's, so the stringing of Docker's needs to be in the same sort of operating system space. So you can't sort of do, can't sort of mix and match that way. That said, and um, it's funny talking to uh, Brian O'Connor, who's sort of our one of our Docker masters, <laughs> at uh, who used to work at the OICR. He he prefers things to be put in one Docker container. That Technically, that being said, you can put multiple. The output of one Docker can be the input of the next. So the issue, one issue with Docker is that, because it's such a lightweight sort of infrastructure, there are, it's less secure than, than a VM, for example. But if you own the VM, and then you have your Docker in it, then everything is, is no concern, because you've got there's nobody's going to come into your Docker because the space that your Docker container is in is owned by you and only you. And so from that point of view, it's less secure, but it doesn't matter because you're 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 a master of, of the ship, of the master of the of the super big ship that the, your whale is into. <laughs>